Amen, amen. Well, welcome to uh, Newport Mesa Church Online Experience. We want to say a special welcome to you if you're tuning in online. I would just like to invite you to let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know what city that you're tuning in from. A special welcome to those who are here in person. We are entering into the Thanksgiving season, aren't we? Come on, aren't you thankful for so much? My... My wife, uh, I, I think my wife has something to be especially grateful for, and it's, uh, it's something that you probably would not have thought about. I'm just testing this if, in case she's watching. She'll be at the second service, but she's grateful for masks. You know why? Have you noticed that when you wear a mask, it's warm? Like, when, as it starts to get cold, it's kind of nice to have your breath right there. So guess what? I don't have to do this winter. I don't have to grow a beard. So, you know what? Thankfulness. There's always a different way of thinking about it, trying to give you some reasons to be thankful. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be looking at another topic that actually is not always something that people are thankful for. So, last week we talked about with Pastor Rudy. By the way, didn't Pastor Rudy and Tony do a great job? Let's just give it up for them. I got to be honest, I, I've not had so much fun applying a sermon to my own life, okay? So, you, if you're not laughing right now, you weren't here last week. So, go back last week, listen to the sermon. And, uh, you know, we talked about the benefits of marriage. There's a lot of amazing benefits. But one of the things that I learned um, being single, I didn't get married until I was about 33, was that there is not a lot of messages about singleness. How many of you know, like, that's, it's kind of a taboo topic in the church today. And I always wish that there was more. I could always listen to a sermon on marriage and take something from it. But today is going to be a message for our singles. So I want you to just um, be encouraged because... Uh, even if you're married, you will be able to, like when I was a single listening to a marriage message, you'll be able to take something from it. Uh, but wa I want to talk about the benefits of singleness because that's literally what Paul is doing in our verses today. And so if you're married, say, amen, I can take something from a singleness message. But I, I really want to help our singles take something because singleness is not often something that you're grateful for. It's, it's just not. It's, it's, it's one of those things that for whatever reason, it's like may, people that are single are made to feel like they're less than. And I want to tell you that that could not be further from the gospel, further from the truth. And I think today you're going to be really encouraged by the season that God has you in. Because like all seasons, seasons may not last forever. No season lasts forever, in fact. But not even every season lasts forever in this life. And this is one of those, um, one of those things that that is for sure something that can be a seasonal thing. Um, the last couple months, these last six months, I, I've, uh, I, like you, have been trying to figure out how to manage the distractions in my life. And uh, when I was uh, a single person, I had less to be distracted by. Uh, getting married and having kids has been wonderful. It's been a wonderful gift. But in some ways... Being married and having a family can actually, potentially, be a distraction. And so I want to dive into that question today with that broader question of what has been a distraction for you in this last season. I'm talking about the things that keep you from the things that you need to be about. The things that you know you need to be about, but for whatever reason, it's like you just can't get there because there's something that stops you from the thing that is distracting you. I don't know about you, but I can get distracted easily. I'm driving down the road, and I just think about when I see the Starbucks symbol, oh, they're giving away those free cups. I better stop. And before you know it, I'm late for a meeting that I needed to be at in time. And that's a small example. The reality is there's so many things that can distract us from the great gifts that God wants to give to us fact the greatest gift that he wants to give to us and so we're going to be talking about distractions in this context of singleness and, and and being solely focused on what God wants to do in our lives we're going to talk about what distracts us why it matters and how to solve it specifically in a message that I hope will be an encouragement to our singles so I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 25 through 40 this is how part of the way that we fulfill our mission is every Sunday we open up the Bible, we turn the pages, we let God speak to us, and uh, we celebrate the transformation and change that we see God doing in us. It, it's our hope that you'll grow in your relationship with Jesus. And if, if, if there's one thing that I hope that you can take from this church experience is that we value this so much. And if you don't take this with you wherever you go, 
you will be an anorexic Christian. You cannot just rely on a Sunday morning message to feed you for the week. So feed yourself this week, um, and let's think about that question this morning. What have we been distracted by in this season? By the way, there's some questions that our online hosts will throw out at the end of the message, and they're really designed for us to go deeper, right, in relationship with each other as we discuss the ramifications, the application of this passage. I mean, literally, talk about a date agenda. This would be a great date agenda with your spouse, uh, or it could be good testing ground to see if someone is spouse-worthy. Can they talk about the Bible with me, right? That's important. Here we go. We're going to read from chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 25. It says this. Now, concerning the betrothed. In other words, Paul's saying this is a message for singles. You married people you got last week, okay? You got a whole bunch of other sermons, and, and this is going to be a message for singles. Not that a married person can't get something from it, because we're broadening it out to really talk about focus and distraction. I have no command from the Lord. In other words, he's saying, this isn't something that I have received directly from Jesus' teaching. Jesus didn't necessarily teach about being single or being married. He taught about the principles of it, but he didn't say to do it or not to do it. So he's, he's saying, this isn't necessarily something that Jesus has specifically told me, but I, get, but, but I give my judgment as one by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy, all right? So again, this is why you trust the hard things that your grandma or your grandpa say because they've proven to be trustworthy to you. And this is what Paul's going to say to us. But I give my judgment as one who is, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? I want you to circle that word bound. That's an interesting word, right? He's going to go back to that word at the end. Do not seek to be free. This is as relevant as it was then. Just two weeks ago, I talked to a man who'd been married to a woman for over 30 years and asked me, how can I get a divorce? Is it possible for me to... He was trying to figure out how to get out of his marriage. So how many of you know marriage and singleness, boom, it's still in our world. This is absolutely relevant. Are you free from a wife? Do not sink a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. <laughs> now, now... Now, all the married people are like laughing right now, right? Because you, you, you know, even a good marriage can be difficult. Come on, don't, don't say amen right there because you're going to get in trouble. You won't be able to apply last week's sermon if you say amen right there. I'm just going to throw that out there. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is Pastor Paul saying, it's hard to be married, especially in light of everything that's happening. And back then, there was a lot of stuff that was happening too. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. He's talking about the return of Jesus. Now, what's interesting to me is he's talking 2,000 years ago. Do you think we're closer or further away from the return of Christ? Right? So this is even more true for us. <laughs> the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives let, uh, live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Hey, let's just pray. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit. We've invited the Holy Spirit. We've worshipped. We've given. Father, we just give you our hearts in this moment. May married people and single people and all people be blessed by the encouragement of this challenge coming from Pastor Paul. These words, Lord, are safe for us to listen to, and they are safe for us to apply to our lives. More than anything that we've heard about this topic, God, let us conform our lives to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 25 through 31, how many of you know that distress can be a distraction? I'm trying to write this in a way that our married folks can still take something from it. Now, Paul goes to the specific parameters of saying in verse 28, marriage can be distressful. Now, how many of you think, based on your understanding of the biography of Paul's life, that it would have been very difficult <laughs> to be married to Paul the Apostle? 
I mean, the guy is extreme. He's always gone. He's probably would have neglected his family. Some people actually believe that Paul was married. We don't know for sure the example of Paul, but for sure a lot of his life was spent in singleness. And it is possible that his wife abandoned him because of his pursuit of Christ. And he goes to the extreme of saying in verse 28 that those who marry will have worldly troubles. In other words, marriage can be a huge distraction. Married, marriage, married life can be stressful. And he says, you know, in light of our context, in light of the fact that this world is not going to be here forever, why add that kind of stress to your life? Now, here's what I know about marriage. Even an amazing marriage can be stressful. But how much more stressful can marrying the wrong person be? I've done a lot of marriage counseling. And some of the loneliest people on this earth are married people. So single people, there's actually something to be grateful for because even though you aren't married, you aren't married to the wrong person. (laughs) And I'm telling you, the only thing, in my opinion, that can get someone like Paul to say it like this is he knows how bad it can get. Because the reality is, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of trouble, a lot of distress in this world, and when you start adding components to it, life can get complicated. When I was uh, a college graduate, I moved up to Alaska, and one of the jobs that I had up in Alaska as a tour guide, um, one summer I decided to not be a tour guide, and I decided to be a server on on a moving dinner train between Fairbanks and Anchorage, right through Denali. How many of you have seen this train, the McKinley Car Explorer, or the Princess, or there's a bunch of different tour companies, none of them are running right now. But what was interesting about this train was that you had dinner or lunch on the train. So there was a top uh, 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 deck that you could just enjoy the scenery, and it was amazing, it was beautiful, and there's nothing more, uh, there's nothing more adventurous than Alaska. I mean, truly, Alaska is the last frontier. I mean, if, if you get, if you spend a winter up in Alaska, you have some serious, like, street cred, in my opinion. Because it gets really cold. There are dangerous animals out there. Most people don't realize moose are actually the most dangerous out of all the animals <laughs> up in Alaska. But on the train, you're fairly safe. But as a server, I got used to the movement. Because a slower-ish train is not super smooth. Have you ever been on a plane where there's turbulence? And you just feel bad for, uh, you know, the people bringing peanuts and stuff. Because it's like they're trying to, like, do two things at once. They're trying to give you something to eat. But they're also trying not to fall on their face in front of you. And, like, lose that whole amazing, beautiful dinner that they have prepared. And what I realized is that no matter what the train ride was going to be that I would have to figure out how to do this. And that's what we do in this world. It's distressful. You've got all sorts of things that are outside of our control. We have no control over whether or not those things are going to bear down on us. But what we do have control over is what happens inside that car. Now, the reality is, as a server, you really don't. If you've worked in the hospitality industry, which I have, I've worked at Red Robin, I've worked at this dinner train, you can get some of the meanest people And guess what you can't do? Go take a hike, right? Because your manager will tell you to go take a hike. Because that's not how you build a business. But you learn to just deal with it. And you learn, I learned to deal with people from New York and from Florida and from Southern California and the Midwest and all sorts of different parts of the world. I learned to deal with it. Here's what, here's what being married, how being married is different than that. You know, if you have a hard person that is hard to deal with, like, at the end of the day, it's like a meal and that's it. But if you marry the wrong person, you have to deal with that every day until one of you dies or is unfaithful. (laughs) Can I just bring it to you straight? Come on, where's my online audience? Like, there's some people trying to figure out, how do I take this message? Proverbs 27, 15 says, a nagging wife is like a dripping faucet. Again, husbands, do not say amen. 
It could just as well say a nagging husband is like a dripping faucet. Man, when you're married to someone who doesn't understand how to make this thing work, it can be really hard. Even the best marriage can be hard. But man, when you're married to the wrong person, it can be so hard. Let me just tell you a story from my own life. No, I'm not going to talk about my wife because she's perfect, okay? <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about my kids, which is basically an offshoot of being married. Up, uh, up here, I've got three colored bars, and, and I'm just going to tell you when, you, when you don't meet the expectations of someone who has expectations, these three bars do not represent Nutrigrain bars, they represent World War III. Because if I come out to my two kids with the wrong kind of bar, and again, Judas too, okay, so he doesn't really understand, like, People don't throw fits just because you bring a different color bar. He's still in the stage where life is all about him. How many of you know you could be married to someone who is like, like life is all about wrong person? Come on, singles, be thankful. It's Thanksgiving. I got an orange shirt on. You can say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not married to the wrong person. I don't have worldly distress coming from inside my home. I got enough to think about being right where I am. And I'm going to tell you there are a lot of people in Scripture who are right where you are. Let me just name a couple. Ruth, Elijah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, John the Baptist, Anna, Martha, Mary, Elijah, Paul. Let me tell you about the most famous person in all of the scriptures who was not married, Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. Well, I don't want, you to, I don't want to follow you there, Jesus. <laughs> the reality is marriage is a good thing. We've talked about how great marriage is. Marriage is a wonderful gift, and not many people can be single for reasons we're going to look at. But I always want to encourage anyone who is in an unmarried state to be reminded that you are not alone. That you are not alone and you don't have to deal with the stress of a messy marriage because all you got to deal with is being focused on creating margin in your life so that you can build on your relationship with Christ. This doesn't mean that single people always do that. As a, as, as a single person, I, I, I wasn't always like a monk in the library reading Greek and Hebrew, right? But I, but I didn't have to deal with someone else's opinion. And, I, and I'm just going to tell you, like, even as a pastor, there were a lot of benefits to being single. I could go out late at night. I could go to events, and, and it didn't matter. I could work 80, 90, 100 hours a week, and sometimes I would. It wasn't because I was obligated to it. I loved it. But let me tell you what I'm not doing right now. That. You have a married pastor with two little kids. I can't go to every high school camp. I can't go to every single thing that gets brought, that, would be, that could be good. It's just part of this season of life for me. And one of the things that I was grateful for in that season, even though I didn't always capitalize on it, was the opportunity of my singleness. My prayer for our singles is that you capitalize on this opportunity because you don't have distress holding you, but you have all the stuff that it could be happening internally because of a desire, and that is also another huge distraction is an obsession with getting married. But when we learn to lay that down and to rest in that marginal space where Jesus is meeting our needs, we have more of an opportunity to embrace the good in this season. I want to show you what that good is. Verses 32 through 35. This is what Paul says. I want you to be free from anxieties. Anxiety is something a lot of people are struggling with, single and married in this season. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. His interests are divided. This is, this is some pretty extreme teaching. His interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is, is anxious about the things of the Lord. Again, not an automatic, but you ha there is a propensity for this. There's also a possibility of a married person to be focused about the things of the Lord. We're going to talk about this as it relates to both. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. <laughs> not to lay any, any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your un divided attention your undivided attention to the lord 
Distress can be a distraction until we detach ourselves from the things that hold us back from what is better. But if God has called us to be free, and the only way to experience the only the, the, the fullest sense of that word, freedom, it will require not just a freeing of ourselves of something, but our an attachment to something else. And the kind of devotion that Paul is talking about here requires discipline. It requires discipline like any relationship that we are in. It requires discipline. And Paul gives us his formula to beat anxiety. This is quote worthy, by the way. Last week, Pastor Rudy said, get your, get your phones out, get your notepads out, write this down. This is a formula to beat anxiety right here, besides medication. Some people might need it. But this is something that you can do. This is something that you're in control. Again, we can't control the distress out there. We can control the stress here. The way that you beat anxiety is also my definition of dis- discipline. Is you've got to point your anxiety in the right direction. You see, all of us want to please someone. There is a built, actually, if there's no desire in you to please anyone, <laughs> there may be some other psychological things going on, right? We're, we're created for community. We're created for people. We're created for relationship with God. And the married person struggles with being anxious or being too focused on a marriage or earthly relationship And Paul says the key to developing the kind of devotion that is required for ultimate fulfillment in his life is to be disciplined by where we put that anxiety. So instead of being being anxious about the things of this world, we're anxious about the things of the Lord. By the way, you don't have to be single to be anxious about the things of the Lord. right? A married person can apply this to their life. Again, I've met a lot of people who are lonely in their marriage, and this verse is powerful. To be anxious for the things of the Lord. Can we just take a devotional check? I was listening to a podcast this week by a podcaster by the name of Mark Sayers. He lives in Australia, pastors a church called Red Church. And he said that there was a there was a, a statistic about people in church in the last seven months. They've been on total lockdown in Australia. He said that he said it was either 60 or 70 percent of people in Australia feel like their relationship with God has gotten better since the pandemic started. No raise of hands, no amen, no whatever. Is that true of you or not? On a scale of one to 10, what has your devotional life looked like? When I say devotional life, I'm literally talking about this verse. This is where the word devotional came from. Your time with God. Your undivided time with God. I'm not talking about being in the shower or doing something else. I'm talking about where you spend time with God. And maybe that could be you go on a walk and you're praying, you're driving and you're listening to God's word, but the time where you are spending with him. What's the quality of that relationship? Here's the reality. You can sustain a Christian life for a long time, but you'll never go deeper, you'll never go farther unless you figure out how to self-feed, how to be undivided in your heart so that Pastor Jordan doesn't have to be the only one stuffing meat chunks down your throat. The Holy Spirit's a lot better preacher anyways, I found. Man, he knows how to just go where no person has gone before, right? Like, the Holy Spirit knows how to, but that only comes when there is created margin space in our life that we just say, God, you know what? You know what it was in our service when Rudy, Pastor Rudy came up here and just said, come on, let's just create a space right here in this moment. <sighs> Jesus, I lay that down. Jesus, I lay that down. Jesus, I lay that down. If we aren't willing to lay those things down, this is, this is why this is so important, right? This is why this is so important. We can talk about distractions and focus all day long. This is why this is so important. If we don't create space in our world for this, we hold on to things too tightly. And we never give ourselves an opportunity to kind of release 
our grip over these things that may be gifts from the Lord. They could include a spouse or children. It could include a job or work. And, and all of a sudden when something like this happens, it's like it is a two by four hitting us over the head because we haven't given God space to do that. I was having lunch with someone this week and they, they just said, man, this past Saturday was so powerful. I was just weeping before the Lord because I'm going through this circumstance that's so hard and I was just re- releasing this to the Lord. Oh. <sighs> He gives and takes away. There are seasons of companionship and partnership and there are seasons of just walking it out with the Lord where his grace is enough for our grind, where his grace is enough for whatever it is that we're going for. And if we haven't consecrated these things that are so important to us, to him, they're actually unsafe in our hands. When we've made our spouse an idol or our state in life an idol, let me just repeat that, singles, listen, You are in an unsafe zone. A.W. Tozer is just one of those guys that I love to read. He wrote a book called The Pursuit of God that radically revolutionized my devotional life, my perspective of what really matters in this life. I mean, talk about focus. And he says something to to this end, that whatever we don't commit to the Lord is unsafe. Specifically, he said, everything is safe which we commit to him, and nothing is really safe which is not so committed. I think of the story of Abraham and Isaac in the Old Testament, where God, knowing from the very beginning this would be a test of Abraham's heart, asks Abraham to give up what is most important to him, and God gives him something better, proof that he will provide. In our lowest moment, in our greatest need. And yet I know that there is a too far moment because I've read of marriages that were not marriages. I've counseled people who were not in marriages where people... And this is just my opinion, hide. They're not hiding in the hiding place of Christ. They're hiding and not really allowing the Holy Spirit to shine light on these parts of our heart. And one of the hardest things I ever had to read was when one of my mentors from afar, A.W. Tozier, was reading about his marriage and realized he had one of the worst marriages ever. This man who knew what it meant to be in the hiding place had not created a hiding space for his own family and for his own kids and for his own wife. In fact, after he died, his wife was quoted as saying, Aiden, A.W., Aiden loved Jesus Christ, but Leonard loves me. What would be worse, that we would get to the hiding space and the people that live closest to us have never experienced the joy of the Lord? I would say this, you aren't going to a hiding place, you are just plain hiding. But man, oh man, it takes discipline not just, to take, not just to take it off on the box, but to make sure our hearts are engaged. There have been people who have done great things for God that had horrible, horrible marriages. And I'm not here to judge, but I'm saying some of these names you would recognize. John Wesley, William Carey, David Livingstone. And they couldn't figure out how to cultivate their own marriages and their own families, and their own kids. I'm just going to tell you, I don't want that. I would rather be a good husband and a good father and a godly human than to pastor you and talk about all sorts of wonderful things if that is not true. It's got to be a pursuit in our, in our lives, not just mine. Or else people will feel the shadows from us. They will sense. They will sense. You know what I've sensed from the church in the last seven months? I'm just going to be real honest. We have not been going to the secret place. I'm friends with you on social media. I'm friends with a lot of Christians on social media. It has distressed me to see the lack of fruit in the church. But I want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. Just go to the secret place and let God grow that stuff that only he can grow. Recommit your hearts to the margin that is required. 
to discipline your life so that your heart can be undivided to the Lord without sacrificing things that God hasn't called you to sacrifice. Singles, learn to live in relationship now because it doesn't necessarily get easier when you get married. Because now it's just two people bringing their baggage. But man, when you let the Lord be that, that third part of that triangle, what a strong marriage you can have. Verses 36 through 40, this is where Paul hits it, on, hits it on the head. He says this in verses 36. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are too strong, right? We've, we've talked about the, the, the intense struggle of sexuality in the church and how devastating the consequences of sexual immorality can be. So Paul is saying, I, I hear, I hear I see, but if you, can't, if you can't hang in this zone, and it, it, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry. It is no sin, but whoever is firmly established in his heart, s- circle that word right there and underline, firmly established in his heart. This is not some half-hearted thing that a lot of people slide into marriages, and guess what? It's just as easy to slide right out. A marriage is a covenant, not just a decision. Being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and, his de- and he, again, he, he repeats it, and has determined this in his heart. Man, I just underline that right here. The intentionality Paul speaks to. To keep her as his betrothed, he will do well, so that then he who, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, this is Paul's opinion here, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the spirit of God. Single single people are no less a part of God's image than married people. Especially in the context of us coming together in the body of Christ, we all get to be a part of the body. We're all a part of the family. And even when people are disciplined and they are devotional, we can still go through the motions. Uh, you know, you can do this in your marriage. You can do this in a church service. You can do this at work. You know all of the things that are required, and you just mark the boxes. You know, I woke up, I, I read three verses, and I thought about it for a little while. Check. I did this, check. I served here, check. I heard Pastor Rudy talking about the dream team. I know our church needs people, especially in this new exciting season. We're going to be in the double tree for a year and a half, and then we're going to be in our new location, and I know it's going to require all of us as a body binding up together, check. You know what the most important thing in all of this is? It's our hearts. (laughs) We've got to make a a determination in our hearts to be focused on Christ, on what he's called us to. It's not about checking boxes. It's about letting the Lord firmly establish this thing in our hearts. You know where God establishes anything in any heart? It's in that secret place. It's not going to be established anywhere else. It's going to be when the Holy Spirit just breathes that into you because there's nothing that I can do to guilt you into doing anything that you won't just be guilt-free on the other end of it. We slide into marriages and we slide out singles. You've got to have God breathe this into you. It's by the power of God and the power of his spirit that we live a victorious life. And here's the reality. Marriage is for life. Mic drop. You don't, no. You don't go into it thinking, I'm going to try this out. That's not how you go into it. Not Christian marriage because Christian marriage represents God's faithfulness to us. This doesn't mean that there is condemnation for people who have made mistakes and are on a, on a second, third, fourth, fifth. I don't care how many tries you've had at this thing. But from this moment, from this moment, we've got to understand that this is for life. This is for life. But I think on the other end of the spectrum, some of us have to insert a word. Marriage is only for life. Matthew 19 gives the two reasons biblically that we could potentially get a divorce. Matthew 19, Jesus says, unless it for marital unfaithfulness. And then 1 Corinthians 7.15 talks about this idea of abandonment. 
if a Christian is abandoned by her non-believing partner, and there are some different ways that you could define abandonment, those could be ways to get out of a marriage. But the third way, and the way that will come to all of us, is when one of the marriage partners dies. When, when, when I do the weddings, I say, I talk, when, I, when we're doing the vows, it's always until death do us part. If a married person wants to continue to wear their ring, that's wonderful. But they're not bound to a human at that point. They're not bound to a human. Now, the reality is, this is the heart's determination, and we make determinations by all sorts of reasons. But when God speaks and we hear him speak, and it's not just because I, I really want to have sex, right? I, I talk to a lot of young people, and honestly, let's just have some real talk. Some, one of the biggest drivers for, for marriage for a younger person is sex. For maybe in, for, for an older person, it's sex. It, but, and, and as important as, as sex is, we talked about it being the glue for a marriage, it cannot be the only reason people get married. There, there, there has to be more. There has to be more, or else that marriage will suffer. And you could be having a lot of sex, and you're not one. We talked about all, that also, and close. But it's, 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 it's being willing to be led by what God speaks to us in that secret place, right? Living that focused life with God. And it, for some people, I think that you, you will actually grow more in your relationship with Jesus when you get married, because at the end of the day, that's what the partnership is all about. It is partnering together for the advancement of God's kingdom in this world. But some of you will do that better without a spouse. In 1910, Lillian Trasher showed up in Egypt. She was an Assemblies of God missionary. She had gotten there because she heard a message that sparked her heart about kids who didn't have parents. She went on to work for an orphanage for three years, and she was actually engaged to a, a pastor. Boom, right? Like lined up. This must be what God wants for me. And they had a conversation about serving overseas. And 10 days before her wedding, she called off the engagement. If you know the story of Lillian Trash, you know that within just a few months of being in Egypt, she took in her first orphan. And over the course of her life, as a single female missionary, she saw over 21,000 baby Egyptian kids cared for, loved, adopted because she heard the breath of God. And she was determined in her heart to follow that. My dad used to tell me, Jordan, your second most important decision in this world is who you marry. Singles, if there's one thing that I could encourage you with, don't be in a rush to get married. Um, yeah, you might have to take a cold shower here and there. You might have to be disciplined in your relationship with the Lord in ways that maybe you haven't been, but that's God's call on your life now. Because the most important decision that you'll ever make in this life is your decision to follow Jesus. Man, oh man, what incredible wisdom my dad gave to me. And he was speaking from a positive, healthy marriage. I can hear that from someone speaking from a hard marriage just as well because as much as I wanted to get married when I was young I knew that marriage was something that would only be for this life I've got a really long string here sometimes I take it camping with me I mean I could just keep doing this forever and I think some of these big decisions that we make in life, we need, to, we need to really think about in light of eternity. I've got so much string up here, I could probably wrap this whole room in it. And this is not even close to the reality of this truth. You want to know how much my life is? Maybe that much. The truth of eternity... So my marriage, if it's really great, amazing, awesome, that's what I got. Singles, this is why we don't place marriage on an altar and worship it, because it ends. 
in light of eternity, which is what my dad used to say, what am I living for? How am I living? And I could literally be doing this for the rest of my life and still not even get close to the reality of what eternity looks like and the relationships I'm investing. Friends, in the middle of this pandemic, we have got to fight for our focus. And if you're married, let your partner be a partner in your fight for your focus. If you're single, I mean just go all in with Jesus in this season. Put all of your cards in that because nothing but disappointment awaits you if you put it in anything else. Even for those of you who put it in people. Whether it's in this or it's in that, I don't even need to go there. I'm just telling you the only place that your heart is safe is being hidden in Christ's grip. There may be people who aren't married, not because they don't want to be, but maybe because they can't find someone. And that was me for a long time. I wanted to be married, but it just, the person wasn't there. I tried. Maybe, maybe if that's you and, and I'm speaking, I don't even know who I'm speaking to. I just know that in scripture there are, are decisions to live with that kind of focus and sometimes that decision is made for us and it sometimes feels very unfair. But there were people in scripture that also lived with that forced on them. I think of Daniel. It was Lillian's choice. She made a decision within 10 days of her marriage to move. And who knows, maybe she could have found someone in Egypt, but Daniel didn't have that choice. From all of what we know about Daniel, he was a eunuch, which means they, they didn't make it possible for marriage for him. And you know, I look at the story of Daniel and I'm inspired because Daniel is actually one of the very few characters in all of the Bible, in all of the Bible, in all of Scripture, that doesn't have some horrible mark against his ministry besides Jesus. Daniel lived a life focused on God. And when his nation needed him, God propped him up and he was a voice for God. And as an octogenarian, as an 80-year-old, when the political nature of his society has shifted and there was all sorts of plots against him, as an 80-year-old who had lived his life for God, praying and being invested and spending time in that secret place. He was thrown into a den of lions. And God shut those mouths shut. Can you imagine an 80-year-old being thrown into a pit with vicious lions and the king coming back the next morning and saying, what? What kind of focused life have you lived that this is what I'm seeing? I'm telling you, a focused life for Christ will do far more damage in the, in the kingdom of God than, an undivide, than a divided heart. It's so important for us in this next season. This is the message that binds our whole church together in this season because we've got to be undivided in this season, not letting anything get in, in between of where we're at. We are God's people moving forward, not allowing bitterness, not allowing any sort of sin to get into the body. And you know what? God may remove people, but let's not remove ourselves. Let's be faithful to what God has called us to do. I want to invite you to stand. The journey starts with one single step. It always starts. This is, we're a God first church. It starts with giving our hearts to him. He has to transform our hearts for us to be able to walk this out. Lord, we commit our hearts to you this morning, right now. We recommit our hearts to you this morning, right now, married and single. May we live undivided lives with hearts sold out for you, all in for your mission. Lead us and guide us, protect us, provide for us. Jesus, we see you as our Lord, our Savior, and our Shepherd. Prove to us, Lord, in this next season that you haven't given up on us, and that you never will. In Jesus' name, we commit.